Well, it's great to be here. After the introductions from uh, Steve, John, and, and Mark, I think the wise thing to do would be to sit down right now. Because <laughs> I, I, in my wildest dreams, I aspire to live up to those ambitions. I'm going to try. But I'm going to resist, uh, resist the urge to sit down. So I think the way a community treats a newcomer says an awful lot about the community. If you indulge me for just a couple of minutes, let me tell you what's happened to me since July 24th. That's the day that the university announced that I would be the 13th Dean of Stanford Law School. It's both an honor and a thrill to have the position, and I'm, I'm really humbled when I think about the excellence of the institution and the wise and vis visionary leaders who've come before me. But what happened over the next month and a half pretty much amazed me. I know this is an overused phrase, but I am not making this up. Several hundred Stanford Law School alumni have reached out to me. They have welcomed me. They've tried to find some connection with me. They've told me how much they loved Stanford Law School and how sure they were that I would love it too. Some of them tweeted about me. Some of them posted about fa on Facebook about me. Every single member of the faculty and every single member of the administrative team here, many of whom didn't know me, reached out to me to welcome me and offer their assistance. Dozens of students, about a dozen student organizations, wrote me or called me to welcome me to Stanford Law School. They told me they were delighted I was coming. Many of them found some way to connect with me. I think I've met every person associated with Stanford Law School who has a connection to North Dakota, which is where I'm from. They all told me why, given my background, I would love Stanford Law School as much as they did. They, they also tweet and do Facebook. So. And then there was the broader Stanford University community. The six other deans of the schools at Stanford reached out to me, including the medical school dean who is so new that he hasn't even started yet, to welcome me, to ask me how they could help, to tell me that they wanted to work with me. Vice presidents and vice provosts called or wrote. At least two or three dozen other people, deans, administrators, students who were not at the law school at Stanford reached out to me, told me I would love it, told me their story, and invited me to ask them for help. Many of the members of the Board of Trustees contacted me. President Hennessy emailed me. John Echemendi called, emailed, and texted me on the day of the announcement. That's pretty high tech. This is just to say every single source of communication with which human beings communicate with each other was filled with welcomes, good wishes, and offers of help. And here's why I'm amazed by this. I'm, I'm from a pretty big family. I grew up in a state where everyone knows each other. I went to Yale College, I went to Virginia, I worked on the Hill, I clerked for judges, I've been in academia for 15 years, I've visited a lot of different institutions. I, I know a fair number of people. Of course, those people reached out to me too, but, and I'm not making this up, half of the people who reached out to me in the days after the announcement and in the weeks after it had a Stanford connection, and more than uh, three quarters of them didn't know anything about me. So I, I, can, I know what the economists would say about this. Transaction costs of communications have fallen to zero. <laughs> Benefits exceed costs. But I, I don't think that's the story. First of all, some of the emails were really, really long. Some were sent at 3 AM. Some were sent from Singapore, Australia. Some were sent from mountain treks during a short period of internet or cellular connection. The transaction costs for everybody were not low. I think what happened was loud and clear about the Stanford community. I, I, I have noticed a lot about Stanford as a newcomer. Everyone has a fitness regime here. Uh, there's the band. But the most striking thing I noticed about Stanford, and I notice it every day that I'm here, and I noticed it 2,800 miles away sitting in my office, is the community. That came through loud and clear in every communication. It's tight-knit. It's fiercely loyal to its members, it's devoted to excellence, and it welcomed me and converted me instantly to a member. I've been in the job since September 1. So as a newcomer, I'm engaged in an intense study of everything I can learn about Stanford Law School and Stanford University, and to think very hard with your help about what's next for us. I thought you might appreciate a report from the field through the eyes of a newcomer. Here are some things that I have learned in the time that I've been here, or have happened in the time that I've been here. 
first, I have learned a lot more about what John Etchemendy talked about and what Mark talked about, something I'd observed from afar. I've learned that Stanford is truly a leader in legal education. It is not hype. The education we offer our students is extraordinary. The availability of all of the greatness of Stanford University through interdisciplinary programs, the extraordinary experiential learning we give our students. I really believe we are preparing our students more for their professional careers as practicing lawyers, as entrepreneurs, as policymakers than any law school in the country. But let me give you a report on the students. They are, they're, they're really inspiring. They are critically minded. They're ambitious. They're passionate. They're wicked smart. And they are just fun to be around. So here's a snapshot of recent accomplishments. So we just learned that we have set a new record for clerks on the Supreme Court. We will have six clerks on the Supreme Court next year. Stanford's had an unbroken record of a Stanford person there every year for 40 years, but this is an all-time high. Our Afghanistan rule of law project just obtained a $7.2 million grant a couple of weeks ago. This is a student-driven project that's doing foundational work to build rule of law in areas where we need it most. There are lots of things necessary to build a culture of rule of law, obviously. But one of them is certainly a group of lawyers who have been trained well. In the Afghanistan project, Stanford Law students have developed a curriculum for legal studies. They have written textbooks that are used in the curriculum. And these are the first textbooks, in some cases, that have focused on the post-2004 period in Afghanistan. The new grant is going to permit an expansion of the program and partnering with other institutions offer a five-year degree at American University of Afghanistan in Kabul. Our students are not all making contributions in, the, in the, this somewhat conventional way. In the short time I've been here, I sat through a presentation by a recent graduate who founded a project slash website called Rap Genius. If you know it, you're a lot cooler than I am. The site is a guide to the meaning of rap lyrics. You listen to songs, you read the lyrics, you click on the lyrics, and anything that interests you, there's commentary about them. It's actually sort of like Talmudic commentary, which is one analogy he used, or a poetic uh, co commentary on poe poetry. It's, it's crowdsourced, so m as members make their contributions, they sort of get assessed by the rest of the group, and some rise to the top as the best commentary. What was clear in this presentation is that this student deeply believed that his legal education contributed to his success. He was really an innovative and creative individual. And he had been very inspired by the faculty here, especially uh, Joe Bankman. Just yesterday, we learned that 3L, a 3L student, Angela McCrary, McCray, I'm sorry, won an honor honorable mention for a highly competitive national pro bono award. She had an idea to start a project that would help incarcerated women as they were about to get out of prison. Angela, who has an MBA and a CPA, had a really specific idea. She wanted to help these women start a business. So the program has a classroom component where they learn marketing, accounting, business principles, and then they're connected with business members of the business community who are willing to help them. So the Day 35 report on the faculty is just as impressive. Pam Carlin was asked to write the foreword to the Harvard Law Review's review of the last term of the court. She presented that to the faculty some weeks ago. It's called Democracy and Disdain, which is a play on John Ely's uh, famous book, Democracy and Distrust. Barbara Van Shevick's book, Internet Architecture and Innovation, has just come out in paperback. This book has been applauded by reviewers from legal academics to computer scientists to regulators and regulators in the US and Europe and elsewhere who are struggling with questions about the infrastructure and regulation of the internet are relying on it. A law journal just passed my desk, and it sits on my shelf now, that contains something called a fest shrift to Bob Rabin's work. A fest shrift is a gathering to honor an especially respected scholar. People offer papers that are in the tradition of the scholar or reflect in some way the influence the scholar has had on the field. I was trying to think of the non-academic analogy for this. I think uh, Bob has been inducted into the scholarly hall of fame to have a fest shrift devoted to his work. His scholarship has taught us a lot. It's difficult to summarize, uh, but one tort scholar put it this way. Bob has shown us that the ev evolution of tort liability, even recent developments like the 9-11 Victims Compensation Fund don't take place in isolation, but they are part of larger developments in society. 
For several weeks this fall, John Donnie, who's been locked in the basement of a prison in Connecticut, this is just during the day, he hasn't committed a crime. John was there because he was the chief witness to challengers of the Connecticut death penalty. He'd conducted a rigorous analysis over many years of the imposition of the death penalty in Connecticut, and he concluded it was extremely arbitrary in application. John's work was powerful enough to convince the Connecticut legislature to abolish the death penalty going forward. This trial is about whether the death penalty can be imposed on individuals who are, were already on death row. Mark Lemley was so in demand during the Apple versus Samsung trial and, and analyzing it after the fact that I'm absolutely convinced that he cloned himself. And I don't want to leave out Jeff Fisher, who this Monday argued a case in the Supreme Court. It was on the very important but also quite excellent question of whether a houseboat is a vessel for purposes of admiralty law. This got the juices of the justices really flowing. The other side claimed that a vessel was in the legal sense, it was a vessel in the legal sense if it, quote, floats, moves, and carries people or things on water. Chief Justice Roberts said, well, how about an inner tube? <laughs> Justice Breyer said, what about a styrofoam sofa? <laughs> so this is just a really tiny snapshot of things that I have observed or experienced or encountered since I arrived. And believe me when I tell you that I had many, many, many more stories I could tell you about what goes on here. So I'll tell you just for a minute or two about my impressions of all of this. I'm, I'm astounded by the variety, the quality, and the significance for both our understanding of law, for policy, of the work that's being done here. Everyone strives for excellence, and Stanford Law School strives for excellence, too, and in general, I think we've achieved it, but I don't think we suffer from the usual deficiency of achieving excellence, which is complacency. We don't walk around congratulating ourselves. I, well, I do, but I, I, think, I think I'm allowed to do that. I don't think people are complacent. I'll give you one more example. In my effort to learn everything I can about Stanford Law School, I've been meeting everyone in sight. My assistant tells me I have 160 meetings in September and October. In these meetings, because I'm new, I say, well, what do you do at the Stanford Law School? Can you tell me about how you do what you do? And then I often say, well, why do you do it that way? And I can tell you that never once has someone said an answer to that question, well, that's how we do it here. What they do is they lean forward and they say, do you think there's a way to do it better? Tell me, tell me about what, you, what the way is to do it better. So when I told an alum this morning that it was this combination of excellence and openness to change that most appealed to me about Stanford, he said, yep, that's in the Stanford DNA. So I've been taken into the Stanford family. It's in my DNA, too. In the next months, I'm embarked on a mission to not rest on the excellence we have achieved, but to find out what we should do next. I'm traveling throughout the country to meet many of you. I want to talk to you about what should our law school be doing? How do we take ourselves into the future? Even if I don't see you at those events, I hope you'll reach out to me and share your views with me, your ideas with me about what we should do next. That's going to help me formulate what's next. And after I formulate it, I'm going to ask you to help me. So thanks for your time and your really gracious welcome. <laughs>